So you are welcome to class this morning. We are moving to basic principles. We are going to look at the basic principles when we are talking about culture. So before we continue the class today, let's look at a recap of the last class. Last class, we looked at, we tried to give an understanding of horticulture by giving definition. And I told you that the simple definition of horticulture is garden cultivation. And then we also tried to explore the horticulture industry. And I told you that when we talk about the horticulture industry, it involves olericulture, pomology, and ornamental. Olericulture, pomology, and ornamental. And then we try to look at the various horticultural crops under these, you know, three main branches, olericulture, pomology, and ornamental. Of course, and don't forget that I told you that ornamental has two branches, floriculture and ornamental horticulture. And we looked at the various disciplines within horticulture. And I mentioned eight of the disciplines when we talk about horticulture, we have olericulture, pomology, floriculture, ornamental horticulture, viticulture, arboriculture, and then uh, we also talked about soft science. And the last but not the least, we talked about um, post harvest physiology. Post harvest physiology, those are the eight areas of discipline. Then we also looked at the employability skills that we have in the field of horticulture. The employability skills that we have in the field of horticulture are plant improvement, propagation, crop production, plant protection, utilization, and landscaping. I'll say that again, plant improvement, propagation, crop production, plant protection, and of course, landscaping. Then we briefly looked also at the role of horticulture. The role of horticulture, and we looked at three basic roles. We have food and nutrition, emotional, and environmental. So, horticulture plays a significant role in the food and nutrition of humans, and of course, in our emotional stability. I told you last week of how people relate with plants, and it brings a kind of calmness. And of course, we also looked at the environmental you know, beautification and improvement. Horticulture also plays a role in environmental improvement and management. Then we looked at the career or enterprise in horticulture, the career or the enterprise in horticulture. And under that, we put it basically under two. We can have the private, the, the, the public, and the private sector. So, of course, horticulture comes across those two. You can have, develop a career, whether in the public service or in the private service. And the last but not the least, we looked at classification. But one thing that I want you to note is that the attendance for last week, only three people got the full attendance of for class last week. Only three people got the full attendance. I told you earlier on that we are to sign me in 10 minutes into the lecture and 10 minutes before the end of the lecture. But I discovered that it is only three. And then there were many of you too that other people signed for you. For those ones, you did not get any attendance for last week because other people signed in for you. So it is only three people who got the full attendance and those people that other people signed for will not get attendance because it was other people that signed in for you. Next class, of course, I'm going to read out the names of all of those people. And I hope that it will not repeat itself again. Because one thing is very important, listening and obeying instructions. I told you that you will sign in 10 minutes into the lecture and 10 minutes before the end of the lecture and not any other person signing in for you. Um, so as we continue, I told you that we're going to look at briefly the basic principles today. And so we are looking at environmental factors in horticultural crop production. What are the environmental factors or the factors, the environmental factors that you have to factor in or consider when you're talking about horticultural crop production? 
You should note that successful uh, horticultural practice depends on excessive control of the environment. So without the control of the environment, it will be very difficult for us to successfully you know, produce most of the horticultural crops that we have. So when you are selecting, for example, a site for the production of any course, it is a, of any of the crops, it is determined by the physical, the economic, and the sociological factors. So you need to look at the physical, climatic, and of course, sociological factors. All of these, you know, are interwoven and they play a significant role in the success of horticultural crop production. Some of the physical factors that we have to consider are climate and the soil. Climate and the soil. Of course, you should know that when we're talking about horticultural crops, especially in this part of the world, we still depend heavily on the soil. I know that in most developed countries, there's a lot of technology that has been developed such that we can produce crops without soil. But basically, we still need the soil here. So you need to consider the climatic and the soil. You know, they play a very, very important role in the production of horticultural crops. And some of the climatic factors is that we have to look at is temperature, rainfall, humidity, light, the altitude, slope, and day length. All of this impacts the yield of the plants. So based on, for example, and all of these uh, climatic factors, like I said, they play a very significant role in the success of most of these crops. And of course, the climatic factor will determine also the type of crop that will grow in certain places. For example, in Nigeria, there are, there are, in the north, there are certain crops that can be produced because of the climatic factors. And the same thing down here in the south, there are some crops that are produced that it will be difficult you know, to grow in the north because of the uh, climatic factors. So we are look, going to briefly look at, you know, based on the temperature variations that we have, um, we can have um, three basic categories when we talk about production of horticultural crops we have the tropical the temperate and the subtemperate so the ones that are produced in the uh, tropical climate are you know in the tropical climate we have equitable climate and there's no distinct winter that means we don't have a season that is very cold for for example you know and in most of those countries where they have winter it is synonymous with uh, snow but Around here, we don't have. So we, we can say here is the tropical environment. Then we have the subtropical. Uh, in this climate, there are, there are distinct winter and, of course, summer. And then in the temperate, we have distinct winter, summer, autumn, we have spring. Then during the winter, of course, the temperature is oftentimes below you know, the freezing point. That's very common there. So we also look at rainfall. And when we're talking about rainfall, the pattern of rain will also decide the type of crop that is to be grown in the um, environment. Whether, for example, in Nigeria, whether in the north, in the south, it, the, the rainfall too determines the, the type of crop that is grown. And when we are talking about rainfall, of course, we talk about it in terms of the, the, the duration, you know, for how long. For example, and also in terms of the amount. So we look at the duration and also in terms of the amount. For example, we can have like, except of course, during this period where we have a lot of climate change and things are changing, oftentimes, sometimes from April to around November in the southern part here, we have a lot of rains. But in the northern part, it is between maybe sometimes three to four months. If they have max, they can have like five months. But because of the... Um, um, climatic um, changes and all of that, now we are witnessing something different. It is in this month now that a lot of us are started praying for, you know, serious rains to come. So in high rainfall areas, we can have issues with soil erosion, nutrient leaching, and the spread of diseases. Um, those are the, limit, the, the limitations that a high amount of rainfall sometimes cause on some of the crop. Then we can look at humidity. Humidity favors, of course, the spread of diseases, especially fungal diseases. And this often will impact uh, cost of production because it will make the cost of production to increase. Then we look at light. 
when we talk about light, this is very essential, especially for the process of photosynthesis. So, of course, we know that from our simple biology, plants always produce their own food in the process, you know, using photosynthesis and light is very significant in this process. So, without, of course, and in the process of photosynthesis, plants, you know, give out oxygen that is needed and they take in carbon dioxide, carbon, hydrogen, uh, carbon dioxide for the process. So, for growth and development of plants, this process is very important. And when we're also talking about light, we talk about light in terms of the intensity and the duration. How intense and what is the time duration. So light intensity can be estimated from the number of hours of bright sunlight or from the cloud cloudiness. So in terms of intensity, how intense, you know, in terms of the hours of bright sunlight to compared to cloudiness. And generally, horticultural crops need a lot of light. Most horticultural crops need a lot of light when they are grown. Of course, especially here. Um, but there are some crops that can also tolerate shade. Of course, that's why we have some plants that are regarded as indoor plants. There are some too that, you know, we can also put partially in the shade and they still need certain amount of light too. So in terms of the duration of light, that is time that is elapsing between dawn and dusk. Oftentimes, the, it is referred to as photo period or the day length. The photo period or the day length, that's the duration. That's the time from that is elapsing between the dawn and the dusk is referred to as photo period or the day length. And this always exerts considerable influence, especially on flowering. It exerts Considerable influence, especially on the flowering of it. Of course, if there's no flowering, there cannot be fruiting. So the flowering precedes a fruiting. So based on the duration of light, you know, the photo period or the day length, we have three basic plants. We have the long day, the short day, and the day neutral. Of course, for the long day, it needs, you know, light for longer than 14 hours. Uh, for short day, it needs, you know, longer than 10 hours. And of course, we have the day neutral. So the soil is the most important natural resource for horticultural crop production and we should protect it. In developed parts of the world, you know, technology has been developed such that crops can be produced without soils. But in this part of the world, because we are still developing, we still depend majorly on soil for the production of most of our crop. That is the source, you know. <laughs> For most of our crop production, so it should be protected, you know, carefully. So and soil will provide support for the plants, and they act as the storehouse for the nutrients and water, as well as oxygen for the growth of the roots of the plant. So most of the time, our plants still depend on the soil because that's where the nutrients that it needs for survival is, you know, taken from. And then the ability of the soil. To support land growth, oftentimes is referred to as the productive capacity of that soil. The productive capacity of the soil. And this depends basically on the fertility of the soil and the physical condition of the soil. So for the soil to be able to produce, to sustain production, continued production, we have to consider the fertility of the soil and also the physical condition of the soil. The soil has to be in good physical condition and then of course the fertility of the soil too. So the soil can also, also enhance optimal potential when we apply organic matter, chemical fertilization, micronutrients and amendment depending on soil analysis report. You know, most of the time here, when a lot of us when we look at soil, we just say, ah, this soil is dark and we believe that it has nutrients. But oftentimes, what is done is that the ideal thing is that whatever, no matter how we try to look at it, we cannot know the status of the soil until we carry out soil analysis. And then the report of the analysis is what is going to determine which particular nutrient that is needed, you know, in the soil. So now we briefly look at the nutrient management in horticultural crop production. I told you that many crops... Of course, they need the soil because the soil is the storehouse of the nutrients that is needed for the soil to produce the food 
that is needed for its growth and its development. So, of course, we also need to look at nutrient management. Nutrients are chemical elements that are absorbed by the plant, and they are used to transform light energy into chemical energy, and also they keep up plant metabolism for the synthesis of organic materials. And these materials constitute food for humans, animals, and a range of raw materials that we use industrially. So when we talk about nutrients, it is the nutrients that is being synthesized into most of the things that we see. The, the, the plants take up the nutrients from the soil and through the process of photosynthesis, they are able to you know, use it for the growth and development of the plants. And then, of course, that's what translates to the food that we eat as humans, even for animals, and also the raw materials that we use also. So, feeding of plants with nutrients is referred to as nutrition. So, the way plants are being fed, you know, with the nutrients is referred to as nutrition, just like humans do. Then, successful growth and production of plants oftentimes require a proper supply of 16 elements. Of course, I know that from simple chemistry, we should know most of these basic elements. And the elements are regarded as essential, of course, for plants. And we have the basic elements. The basic elements, of course, they are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Those are the basic elements. Then we have the macro elements. Those are the elements that are required in you know, a larger quantity for the normal growth and development of the plant. And some of the examples of these are nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, sulfur. You know, they are, of course, like I said, they are required in large quantities. Then we have the third, you know, group. They are the micro elements. These are required in small, you know, quantity, just like their name, micro. We have magnesium, manganese, molybdenum, chlorine, zinc, boron, copper, and iron. These are the elements that are required in very little quantity. But of course, sometimes when they are not there, they usually cause deficiency that can, of, of course, harm the plants. Then we look at water and irrigation. Water and irrigation. Of course, water is one of the most important inputs that is so essential when we're talking about crop production generally. So, Horticultural crop production is not an exception. Water is basically needed for life. You often, you know that people always say, nobody, uh, water does not have an enemy. Everybody need, needs water. Just like humans too, we need water. Of course, uh, it has been proven that maybe you cannot stay without water for like about seven days. So the same thing, plants also need water. If there is no water, then of course the plants too will, will come into crisis. They will be rooted. So water is very essential. As it's essential to humans, so much more for plants. So and plants need water continuously during their life and oftentimes in a large quantity. So water influences photosynthesis, respiration, absorption, translocation, and utilization of the mineral elements. So these processes cannot run properly in the absence of water. So for plants to photosynthesize, they need water. So both the shortage and excess of water oftentimes affect the growth and development of plants. So if water is too much, of course it can affect the growth of plants. And if it is too little too, definitely it will affect the growth of plants, especially the yield and also the quality of the plants. So water releases nutrients in the soil for absorption by the plants and also sometimes it's, 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 it, really, it brings about leaching of the nutrients into, you know, further into the soil, sometimes making it uh, difficult for the plants to be able to access most of these uh, nutrients. Irrigation. Irrigation, we have looked at water, very important. Irrigation. Irrigation is the artificial supply of water to the plants in the event of shortage of natural rains in order to obtain rapid growth and increase yield. Irrigation is very important. Water has to be provided, especially when 
during the off season, that especially for us here in Africa and in Nigeria in particular, during the dry season, you need to supply plants, especially young plants, they need to be supplied with water. And since there is no water through the natural process that is real for, that means we have to you know, find other means, and that is referred to as irrigation, that is alternative means, artificial or artificially applying water to the plants during the period when it is in short supply. This is very essential. And how successful, you know, our orchard or our farmland is, is also dependent on how efficiently the, uh, we provide irrigation in our um, orchard. And then it is controlled by such factors as the frequency, that is how often, the duration for the time, and then the intensity, and then the source, the source and the method to which the water is supplied. So I'll say that again. When we talk, when we talk about irrigation, it is controlled by factors such as the frequency, the duration, the intensity, the source of water, and then the method of the supply of water. Um, briefly, I will talk about weed management. Weed, of course, they reduce crop yield. I know that a lot of you, I think first semester you have done weed biology. And of course, I know we have spent some time, but I'll just mention this very briefly. Weeds reduce crop yield because they always compete with the plants for water and the nutrients, you know, light and then space. So that's why they are dangerous. And oftentimes too, they also harbor pests and diseases that oftentimes if affect the plants. So it's very important that before they gain, you know, um, um, the, the, the gain ground, it is important that we quickly control them because oftentimes, if they are not controlled, they usually have a very devastating effect on the crops. So I will look at another basic principle when it comes to horticulture that we will briefly talk about is plant propagation. Plant propagation. Now, plant propagation is very basic when we're talking about horticultural practice. We cannot, it is something that is very um, significant in the field of horticulture. For somebody to say, I am a horticulturist, you need to be well grounded in plant propagation as a horticulturist. So, when we talk about plant propagation, that is the is simply reproduction to the way we perpetuate, of course, the offspring by either sexual or asexual method. So, plants, of course, reproduce to perpetuate their offspring either by the sexual or asexual method. The sexual method of reproduction often produces offspring by the future fusion of gametes, both from the male and the female, that's both parents, just like in humans too. But the thing is that when, uh, of course, this happens in the process of fertilization, and when this occurs, oftentimes there's a lot of duration when we talk about sexual method of propagation, just like in humans, you have children, three, four, five of them, from the same parents, and they're all looking differently because of the variation that has taken place. So, same thing when it comes to the plants. So, horticultural crops are mostly reproduced by asexual method, or it's called vegetative method of propagation. And in this uh, method of propagation, what happens is that if you want the exact copy of, maybe sometimes you desire some uh, desirable qualities for a particular plant, it is the vegetative uh, method of propagation that is often used so that you will get exact. Because when it comes to sexual method of propagation, there is always variation. So through sexual propagation method, even though it is practiced for different, different plants, there are various methods of uh, vegetative propagation for many plants. And they are widely used in the industry, in the horticultural industry. Like I told you, anyone who wants to be a seasoned horticulturist must be versed in the field of plant propagation. So, and for you to do this, you need a knowledge and skill of the identification of the plant organs that are used in plant propagation. 
you need to be versed to know which plant of plant, which part of that particular plant you know you can use for propagation uh, method. So the vegetative means of propagation produces individuals without the future of gametes genetically identical to the parent plant and each other, except of course when maybe like a mutation occurs because in nature. Sometimes some of these things happen and we don't have control over them. Something can go wrong and then there's a mutation. Something is looking completely different from, you know, what we had before. So sometimes some such things also happen where even in plants. So vegetative reproduction is the process of multiplication in which a portion of the fragment of the plant's body functions as a proper goal and then it develops into a new individual plant. So a particular plant, part of the plant is used. It can be the leaf, it can be the root, it can be, you know, the step is used uh, in the production of a new plant, of course, without the process of um, um, sexual, uh, without sexual union or fertilization. Uh, the vegetative propagation is also a form of plant propagation in which the new individual plant arises from any vegetative part of the parents, like I said, it can be from the root, the stem, the leaf, and other organs, and it possesses exactly the same characteristics of the parent, except, like I said earlier, on, if there's a mutation that occurs in nature, because some, some things, some, sometimes some of these things happen. But without that, it should be exact, it should possess the same characteristic as the parent plants, exact. So in higher plants, any part of the body is capable of being used for vegetative propagation. And many plants often produce also modified plant parts that are used in vegetative propagation. So the modified can be a modified stem, a modified root, or a leaf, and is often used in plant propagation. The most commonly known vegetative propagation of plant includes Propagation by cuttings. That's the one that is generally used. And of course, you can cut, you can use propagation by cutting, cutting the root, cutting the leaf, or cutting, you know, the, the, the step. Uh, that I'm going to give you an assignment. You will also look at some of the plants, parts that you can use, you can cut from, and then use in vegetative propagation. I know that during the practical, you will see some of these things. Also, we can have layering, grafting, and then specialized organs or by micropropagation. That's tissue culture, so can also be used. But the most commonly utilized form of plant reproduction is by seeds. Oftentimes, that is it. That's easy. That is using seed as that is the basic. But there are a number of vegetative propagation that includes cutting, grafting, budding, layering separation and division and also micropropagation they are also used uh, because oftentimes when you propagating by seed may not be feasible for example the banana the plantain you know <laughs> so it's difficult to uh, propagate such plants using seed so when there is difficulty or it's not feasible to reproduce through seed you use the vegetative method of propagation to produce. And most crops, most horticultural crops, are also uh, oftentimes produced, you know, vegetatively. So, and that is why plant propagation is very important. So, um, vegetative method of plant propagation is very important because it multiplies the cultivar with individual desirable characteristics, and they do they, they give us true to type. That's one advantage of vegetative propagation over sexual method of propagation. In sexual method of propagation, of course, variability often occurs, but in vegetative, we produce exact plants. So to ensure a faster initial plant growth and higher survival rate of plants, and then higher yield in terms of quality, vegetative method of propagation is often used. And the most common, um, Vegetative propagation, especially through cutting that is used, is the stem cutting. You know, propagation by cutting the stem. It produces a ball, and then the plants, the new plants, grows from there. Then we also have other specialized
vegetative structures. So there are other plant parts too. But I told you that this uh, cutting stem cutting is also the stem is one that is often used. But there are other plant parts too. So we look at the specialized vegetative uh, parts that are also used. So we have the runners, the suckers, the crowns, the offset, the bulb, the comb, the tubers, the rhizomes are used. You know, and most of them are primarily for storage of food and nutri nutrients and water during ad adverse condition. And of course, they can also be used as proper goods to reproduce that uh, uh, plant. So most plant products, these modified plant plants, they are generally herbaceous perennial. Those that have these um, plant plants that I've mentioned, the suckers, the runners, the crown, the offset, the combs, the tubers, all of them are the herbaceous perennials in which the shoots die at the end of a growing season. But the fleshy vegetative structure usually do not die and they remain in the soil. And oftentimes they are used you know, for vegetative growth in the next season. So let's look at propagation by division. Propagation by division. This is the form of plant propagation in which a group of the plant or plant plants are caught or sun apart from each, you know, and then divided uh, the, the, I'll take that again, the plant propagation by cutting is a form of plant propagation in which a group of the plants or the plant parts are cut or torn apart from each other and then they are divided. And the part that is divided contains one or more of the roots of the plant or stem or, you know, and then this again, is from this a new plant is eventually formed. Of course, plants that have, for example, fibrous, ramatosous roots and plants that form clumps or crowns are typically split, you know, through division. And then, of course, they are propagated through these specialized organs. So, we'll briefly look at examples of some of these plants, plants that are propagated by division. Examples, we have, for example, the potato, Solanum tuberosum. It is propagated by division through using the tuber. So potato is propagated by vegetative propagation of division of the tubers. Then the tubers are divided into sections, each one containing one or more eyes. The, and a tuber is referred, the tuber is referred to as a ticking underground stem that often develops at the tips of the solar horizon and serve as a storage organ. When we have the practical, you know, Dr. Law will show you some of these things so that it's not only, you not only listening on just hearing theoretically and so that you'll be able to have a feel of how it is in practical things. Then another example is ginger, zingiba osifinel. That is by the rhizome, division, plant propagation by division using the rhizome. And a rhizome is a swollen modified stem. It is cut into sections. And of course, each of the part plant that is cut has a bud. And then when it is put, of course, in the soil, the plant grows from that bud. Then I have onion, that is allium sepa. This is propagated using the bulb. And, a bulb, and the bulb is a specialized underground organ that consists of short, fleshy, usually vertical stem, bearing a tip apex and enclosed by thick, flexi scales. Like I said again, you may not be able to connect with this until when you have the practical. Then we have the example of another plant that is uh, propagated by the runner. And then... Another method of propagation that is often used is propagation by separation. Propagation by separation. And we have easily detachable stems. They are severed from the mother plants and allowed to produce new plants. Some of these stems have initiated roots even before being severed from their mothers and they can easily grow into a new plant. Separation and division are the easiest and the quickest way to propagate many plants. Separation and division, they're the quickest way to propagate many of the plants that we have.
We will briefly look at some examples of the plant uh, through using separation. We have the banana and then you use the soccer. The banana is one of the most important food crops that is produced using the soccer. I mean, you use the method of separation using the soccer. A soccer is a lateral shoot that develops from the rhizome and they usually emerge close to the mother plant. I take that again. A soccer is a less lateral shoot that develops from the rhizome and they usually emerge close to the mother plant. And propagation by suckers always follows digging the suckers and then separating it from the mother plant and then growing. Then we have another example is the taro. That is Colocasia esculenta. I, I don't know how many of you know the plant that they call coco coco yam. That is what is referred to as taro. So, and it is propagated by separation using the comb. The comb is a short, solid, and thickened underground modified stem with laser plates. They are distinguished from the ball with their lack of fleshy leaves, you know, for the ball. If you look at the cocoyam, it also looks, you know, like the ball, but in the ball, in that of the ball, the onion, for example, is covered by scales. But this one has like a dry, peppery leaves. And the comb stored the food in the stem, unlike in the bulb where it is stored, you know, in the leaves. Different horticultural plants are propagated differently by their specialized organ, either by separating or by dividing them. They are different organs to produce a new plant. And knowing and applying this method is paramount to plant propagation in order to increase production and productivity of each of the plants. So that's that about um, plant propagation. I told you that it is something that you know you need to really, really know for you to become to beat your chest to say I'm a horticulturist. You need to be well versed in plant propagation techniques. And then I'm moving to another very important principle when we're talking about horticulture, and that is the nursery. I remember when we were talking about the introductory, when we had the introductory class, I told you that the horticulture industry is synonymous with the uh, nursery industry, that you cannot take away the nursery industry from horticulture because most horticultural crops are intensively cultivated crops. And oftentimes what happens in horticulture is that the crops are cultivated first in the nursery before they are transferred to the permanent place. And that is the basic difference between horticultural and then agronomic crops. So many, when you are talking about another basic principle in the field of horticulture is nursery. There is no way you can talk about horticulture and not talk about the nursery. So for nursery, a nursery is a place or an established place for raising or hanging of young seedlings or till they are ready for a more permanent planting. So when you are talking about nursery, it's a place where you raise the plants, you take care of them, and from that place you move them to the, um, the permanent place. It's just like in humans, so when you have a child, take the child to crutch. From crutch you move to the you know, nursery one, nursery two, before you get to the primary school. So it's a preparatory. The same thing for plants, you prepare the plants in the nursery before they are taken to the permanent site. I want to look at the advantages of a nursery. I will briefly just mention like about 10 of them first. Of course, it's a place where uh, siblings are taken care of intensively. It's like ICU, intensive care unit for most of the, the, the siblings. Then, of course, it provides favorable growth conditions there. And then it eliminates the difficulty you know, that we have with the soil. It uh, prevents weed that because in the nursery there's proper weed control, reduce field management costs, then improved crop uniformity. I mean, the crop will be able to develop and grow uniformly. Then, of course, it results in high yield because when you are properly taking care of the plants in the nursery, by the time you move them to the permanent site, to be, you know, they will be able to grow and then, of course, it will increase the yield. Then there is more optimal use of the hybrid seed. Then shorter growing season and more efficient use of land. Then more accurate prediction of harvest dates. Then I'll just mention two of the disadvantages. It increases costs, of course. And then, of course, you have to think of ex extra labor, which is, is becoming very difficult. Now, then 
when we talk about nursery, there are two types. I've told you that the nursery is like the preparing tree. You prepare the plants. They are well taken care before you take them to the permanent site. And then we have two basic uh, nurseries. We have the temporary and the permanent. And for the temporary nursery, we have two types. We have the pizza nursery and then the intermediate nursery. So I said nursery, there are two basic types, both temporary and permanent. But for the temporary nursery, there are two types, the, 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 the peasants and also the intermediate. So the peasant nursery, this includes like spots or places where peasant farmers raise their, for example, like cocoa seedlings, you know, they raise their cocoa seedlings, the places where they raise their cocoa, coffee, citrus seedlings. And they normally locate it either within their compound or along the river bank or a stream or a swamp or a family bathroom or any of the places where they can have regular supply of water and the soil is loose with oil and the seed are sown and they are covered with plant fronts. I tried to show that example there. Then we have the intermediate nursery. It's a slight improvement over the peasant nursery and they are established very close to the field. In order to have, avoid the, the cost or the problems of long distance trans transportation of most of the seedlings. So what most farmers do is that they site somewhere not too far from their, uh, their, their farms or their orchard and they have the nursery. Here, there are no permanent installations. They can be used for one or more seasons. And of course, it also can serve as a rest station. By the time they are bringing the seedlings, they can keep it there before they are taken to the field for planting. And of course, it is advantage of temporary nursery that it can be shifted at any point because you don't have any permanent structures. It is low capital. It, it has there's reduced transport costs. It is within the climatic sites. And then oftentimes very skilled labor is not so much required. And it is very close to the planting site. Then some of the disadvantages that of course, there will be shortage of water supply and then the soil may be poor. And of course, because of uh, the unskilled labor that is not, and most of the time, if care is not taken, it can result in poor quality of most of the seedlings. Then we have the permanent the standard, or oftentimes some people refer to a central nursery. We refer to the, the permanent, like the word is a permanent nursery, it is larger. It is more intensively managed and, of course, proximity to the field is very important when we are talking about the permanent nursery. And then the most important components of a permanent nursery are you have the windbreak, the fence, the tools and materials shed, the chemical store, potting shed, compost heap, source of water, the nursery field, the soil stabilizing units, and also the incinerator. I, like I told you, it is very important to have permanent structures because when we talk about the permanent nursery, then the physical resources that are needed. If, for example, you want to site a nursery, what are the things that you need to consider? For you to site a nursery, you must think of the physical resources that will be needed for you to start the nursery. And of course, like any other enterprise, the nursery to need certain resources. And these resources, they play a very role, a very significant role in determining whether, you know, the nursery will be successful and then the type of the nursery enterprise. And I should state here that there are some people who are referred to as the nursery man. What they do is just to produce their, you know, the crops just in the nursery and then it is from the nursery they sell to people who can who take it to the permanent place. So, of course, you can just stop at nursery. You can develop an enterprise just being a nursery a, a man or woman, a nursery person. And when you're talking about the physical resources that is needed for the nursery, number one is land. That is basic and fundamental. You need land. And you need to consider the area and also think about the soil and how close is the site to the means of transportation. It is not enough to get a land. But is it accessible? Can people easily get there? Can you easily transport your plants, you know, from where you are coming from to the place? And the same time when people want to come and buy, is it easy for them, you know, to transport uh, themselves 
to and fro to come to the place. So means of transportation too is very important when you are talking about selecting the site. Then you need very good irrigation facilities. They are required because, of course, I said that, especially during the dry season, you will need to add another source of water. So source of water, and you know that most of the cultural plants need you know, a large uh, water in large quantity. So irrigation is important. Then labor, in terms of availability and also nearness to labor. How easy will it be for you to get you know, the labor and then how accessible is your land to you know, the area of the labor? Then the availability of power and electricity is very important because you need sometimes to pump water to sp for spraying and you know, dusting and many other operations you will need water. So you need electricity. And there should be good road and transport facility. Very important. It's not enough for you to produce. How do people get to you to buy? That's very important. Then you need to think of the mother plants. This should be selected very carefully. As the sale of most of your nursery stock depends on it. A mother plant is where you get, like the source, where you get, you know, the stock from. So if the source is, is bad, then there's a problem. So you have to be sure that, you know, the mother plant is okay. Then you need propagation, propagating structures. They are very important for the production of grafts or seedlings and also for hardening, hardening of plants. Then you need like a small uh, net house for hardening of the plants. When they bring the plants, before they are now uh, transported, you harden before you transport to the permanent field. Then you need a store and office where you keep your garden tools, your implement, the raw materials, insecticides, and also, um, of course, where you keep your records. So an ideal nursery must have at least a well-managed office also for keeping records. That's very important. Then the selection of your site. The size of your land should depend on the morphological characteristics of your plant species, the size of the stock to be planted, the annual production targets, method of raising the seedling, and the degree of permanence of the site. So, and for preparation of your nursery site, you need to clear the land. Land clearing is very important. You do this by clear felling, you remove, and then sometimes if it is like, for example, in temporary nursery, you can do like underbrushing before you bring in your plants. Then, of course, after clearing or underbrushing, you remove all the debris, you level the land, and then you lay out according to the plan. So for your nursery, the site must also have a plan. It's like when you want to build a house too, you decide whether it's a one bedroom, a two bedroom, a self-contained, a duplex, the same thing with your nursery, it must be properly planned. And of course, you lay it out based on the plans. Then you have, of course, the windbreak establishments of Windbreak. Most of the time, what is used is leguminous trees because, of course, you know the function of a leguminous tree. They can also help to add nutrients to the soil. Then you should think of fencing, especially in places where we have uh, incidents of uh, theft. You, know, you should fence, especially now that we also have incidents of uh, of elders. You know, they just come after you have labored. They bring all their cow and their cattle to your uh, field and just eat up everything. So you need to think of fencing. That's very important. And then, of course, you need to think of the erection of major installations. And then that may include like a storage, a, a shed, your incinerator, and all the pipes, you know, for your irrigation. The important nursery operation that is needed. You need bed preparation. You need layout. Sometimes you need to add farm yard manure, then you sow your seed, and then you prick. That is the shifting of the plant from one nursery bed to, the, to another. So once the plant is here, and then after you move it, that's prickly. Of course, as we go along, to, we will see some other things. Then irrigation, very important. I've said that before. Weeding, then manures and fertilizers. Of course, we, I said earlier that when we're talking about the basic principles that Fertility of the soil has to be maintained. And then, of course, lifting the plants from the nursery to the permanent site. You have to do that carefully to avoid damaging the roots and then also to prevent wilting of the plants. 
Then now, let's look at briefly nursery, some of the nursery techniques. Some of the nursery techniques. It's nursery, the management techniques that we need in the nursery. And this is very important when we are talking about success. So, uh, careful management is needed when we are talking about most of our plants. And let's look at some of the management techniques. We have one shading, crop are different in terms of their shield, shade requirements. So you need to understand the plant you want to grow for you to be able to decide, of course, the kind of shade that you need to incorporate. Then watering is very important. And when we're talking about watering, we need to talk about it in, time, in terms of the time and in terms of the amount and in terms of the quality of the water. That's very important. Then, of course, we need to look at the issue of weed control. That's very important. And then we talk about root and shoot pruning. Root pruning is carried out. We can do that either on bare rooted or potted seedlings. And root pruning involves severing the tap root or the lateral root to be able to give way to maybe vegetative growth of the plants. So depending on the purpose, then we have nursery soil management. Many of the typical crops of the uh, tropical nursery stock take a lot of nutrients out of the soil. And so we may need to incorporate uh, nutrient sublimation, uh, supplementation programs in many of our nursery soil. Then, of course, we need to think of maintenance of the soil fertility. And then that's very important because most of the time, the crops can be uh, the the nutrients will be leached away from the uh, the plants will not be able to assess them. So we we'll think of adding maybe either a chemical fertilizer or organic fertilizer, as the case may be. Then there's need for a maintenance of good physical condition. This and this requires some systematic increase in organic matter content of the soil. Then we need to also look at soil conservation soil conservation, that most of the time, the productive capability, as we need, as we begin to crop year in, year out, it also reduces the productive capability of the soil. And we may need also to, you know, put in some soil conservation methods, such as uh, mulching, and then minimal tillage, then proper bed orientation, and then, of course, windbreak. So, until next class, Enjoy your week. <laughs>